Um, you're the chair, right? So if I fall asleep during my talk, please wake me up. Please. All right. Um, the uh, uh, talk I, I'm giving today is not finished work. It's a, a proposal or an idea or a work in progress or however you want to look at it, um, in which I'm very confident, so I'm, I'm, I don't, you know, I actually feel like I can talk about it, but a lot of it is, uh, is not worked out, so I don't have theorems, uh, I have an idea and um, a direction in which to think about pseudo-differential operators and groupoids and the connection between the two, which uh, of course has been explored for a long time. And uh, specifically, there's a recent paper, uh, basically from last year, Claire de Boer and uh, George Scandalis. Uh, you can find it on the archive. Uh, where they have a specific way of connecting, um, actually not specifically tangent groupoid, adiabatic groupoid, but that's a generalization of a tangent groupoid, and pseudo-differential calculus, uh, the classical pseudo-differential calculus. So, uh, since I've been working quite a bit in uh, non-elliptic index problems uh, and struggled with the calculi that you need in that setting and the relation to the groupoid and various technical details there, I uh, was sort of interested in see if what they did could be adapted to that situation. Uh, and in talking to Bob Junkin, ah, he's here, uh, last summer, we, we talked for a month and starting Basically, starting, taking as a, as a starting position uh, ideas of Claire and, and George, we slowly morphed it into a quite different idea. There's some elements still in there that uh, are, are stolen from their paper, but uh, it's, a, it's a fairly different proposal. Uh, and so I want to, uh, as I said, it's, it's, it's an idea, it's, a, it's a, a direction of research, and it seems that, it, that it's going to work out, but it's not. It's by no means uh, finished. So let me uh, start. By okay, so some of you, well, not that many, unfortunately, were here last week. I explained the tangent groupoid, so um, I guess I've been working with it for too long because it seems like a really simple idea to me, but I notice every time I explain it. And the questions I get afterwards, like nobody really understands very well what, what I'm saying. So I'm, Nigel had a nice suggestion last night when I mentioned this to him. Is to, there's an idea which I learned from him. I don't know if it's your idea, but I, I learned it from you. Which is, uh, a, okay, so it's, it's a bit of a cheat, but it works in talks. So uh, for Rn, the tangent group point is, is, has a very nice description. So. Rn x on itself by translation, and uh, let's call this, al this action alpha, but it's parameterized by, uh, by a real parameter t, positive parameter, or not positive, sorry, real parameter. And the action, uh, let me see if we can get this straight. So it's translation, but rescaled. Except, of course, uh, the annoying thing is if t is zero, it's not rescaled, it's not translation at all. It does nothing. Okay, so it's, it's a trivial action. So, um, what you get is a groupoid, so the transformation groupoid, or right groupoid for this action. Like if you think upon this just for a second, you see that if t is not zero, so we have, uh, say, R2 and R2x on it. So as long as t is not zero, you get exactly one arrow uh, from every point in R2 to any other point in R2 for one specific group element. Okay, so it's a different group element depending on t, but the groupoid is essentially uh, so the groupoid of pairs. So this is the pair groupoid. if t is not zero. Right, so they're all isomorphic. And then at t equals zero, uh, okay, so these two points get closer and closer for a fixed arrow, so to speak. Uh, and then at t equals zero, of course, they start and end at the same point. So you actually just get a family of groups. 
copies of Rn. So I don't know how to write this. This is also Rn cross Rn, but uh, now this is a space, eh? and this is a group. So maybe it's better to write it something like, I don't know. It's a disjoint union of copies of Rn parameterized by Rn. So it's, it's, it's the same manifold, but it's a completely different groupoid. Okay? So there's a jump uh, in, in the nature of this, of this, of this, of this action as, as you reach t equals 0, but nevertheless, they're, they glue together quite uh, as a smooth family. And so um, the tangent groupoid for Rn, which uh, I'll write as fat t of Rn, Okay, so this is uh, basically the, 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 dis the, the disjoint union of all these groupoids, but taken as a smooth groupoid over R. So there's a, an exceptional fiber at zero. So this turns out to be most naturally thought of as a, okay, it's a vector bundle over Rn, right? So it's a family of groupoids, and then here, the pair groupoid everywhere else. And the point is, of course, the gluing. They're glued together in a very specific way. Now, OK, this is an actual definition, and it's completely explicit. Um, but now you want to do this on the manifold. And uh, I've, yeah, explaining. It's really not that hard. It's in Kahn's book. You can look it up if you want to know. And I found that if I explain it in a talk, it doesn't really come across. So what I'm going to say is you can basically do what you do for Rn locally, which is true. You have to kind of do it in the correct way. And then you get a tangent groupoid for a manifold. So this has, actually does have Tm. That's a natural thing to put it at 0. And a pair groupoid m cross m everywhere else. Okay, so that's, uh, of course, this doesn't tell you exactly what it is, but it gives you the, an idea of what it is, which is good enough, I guess. All right, so um, now there's uh, a lot in this paper by uh, Claire and George, but uh, one thing that's in there is a proof of the following fact. If you, if f is a smooth function on the tangent groupoid, And, uh, and then there's a technical condition, and it's uh, somewhat involved, but uh, you could, one, one way to say it is that for all G smooth on M cross M, so those uh, are kernels of smoothing operators, if you're familiar with this formalism. Um, F sub T, right, so F, F is a smooth function, so it, it, you can restrict it to all the values of T. In R, so this convolved with G. G is fixed, so F is, this, is sort of a family of smooth functions, if you like. This, this should uh, decays rapidly as T goes to zero. Again, all in the suitable sense, right? So, so look in their paper. It's fairly involved uh, set of conditions, uh, but it's equivalent to this, and they prove it. So, okay. So it's a very specific choice of functions. Then, uh, for so if you pick such an f, then they show the following thing. This is a theorem. Um, the integral from 0 to infinity, t to the m times this function for the, OK, so this is, you're integrating over r plus with r measure, right? So that's, that's the idea. So uh, in their picture, they sort of uh, ignore the negative t values. So you just look at positive t values. So you restrict, say, to this part here. You average uh, the, these functions f, uh, weight it with, uh, with a power of t. Then this is a kernel of a pseudo-differential operator of degree m, or minus m, maybe. Minus m, sorry. And vice versa. So. Uh, what's nice about this is that you have a, uh, well, 
a definition of, of, of what a classical pseudo-differential operator is in terms of the groupoid. And so, um, okay. it's a nice result. So this is where we started. Sorry? So let's uh, make this compact. For, uh, uh, probably, yeah. You're probably right. So, uh, yeah, th I may have overlooked. Uh, there's, a, there's a fairly long set of conditions here. You may, you may well be right. Okay, I don't, I don't claim that any of this is correct, but it's close to correct. Um, but this is certainly this is certainly correct uh, result. But you know, there's various problems here. So, like I said, this the exact description of these which f you should take is uh, a little bit involved. And okay, so what was the motivation to look at this? Um, other than just it's you know it's interesting, but um, there's there's a different case that uh, I would like to understand. And let me explain uh, the mo the modified setting. Uh, we're going to play this game, this tangent group boy game, with a different group, so namely the Heisenberg group. So let's say uh, dimension 2n plus 1. So Heisenberg group, I hope, but let's, let's, if you don't, that's it, okay. Um, all right, so now you can uh, repeat this construction as follows. So, um, uh, instead of, so what we do here is you, you rescale the action of, uh, of R, uh, the translation action, by a parameter T, of course, that's a, a rescaling by T is an automorphism of the group. Rescaling by T is not an automorphism of the Heisenberg group, but you can easily fix that. You just uh, get a graded uh, rescaling. So um, what we do here is you define uh, delta T. So let's say this is a vector X, this is a vector Y, and here's a real number Z. So this is in Rn cross Rn cross R, which is the group. Uh, and then you just... Uh, do the obvious thing, you, you put a t squared in front of z, and now it's an automorphism. Okay, this is a rescaling uh, with weights, so delta t is an automorphism of the group. If t is not zero. <coughs> and, uh, and then you can basically do the same definition here. So you take the translation action of this group on itself. Uh, so alpha t. Heisenberg group acts on the Heisenberg group by translation, and it's the same formula. Of course, you multiply instead of adding. Okay, but uh, <coughs> and uh, as before, if you take the uh, corresponding groupoid, transformation groupoid. Uh, the same thing happens as here. You have uh, the group, it acts on itself by translation, so any two points are connected by exactly one group element. They, they're, they're quotient, if you like. And if you rescale, it's still the same, as long as you don't rescale with t equals zero. So for any non-zero t, uh, this transformation groupoid is just a pair groupoid. Of course, this g is not that g. There's a, right, there's a formula, you can imagine. Uh, but at, so this is the pair group one. Uh, but if t is zero, as before, this, uh, this kills uh, x, so not, this, this is a trivial action. In this case, we get uh, also g cross g, but now this is a group and this is a space. So you could make uh, sort of a one-parameter groupoid here. Let me call it fat T of T. Uh, 
Um, where we have, okay, a family of groups. Again, I don't know good notation. Uh, It's a disjoint union of copies of G parameterized by G, if you like. And then here we have a pair groupoid. Okay. <clears throat> so that's uh, just a little game with a, with a graded nilpotent group. You can do this with any nilpotent group, graded nilpotent group. Uh, but this has, uh, uh, like the thing we did with Rn, you can do this on a smooth manifold. Uh, this you can do with manifolds that are locally modeled by the Heisenberg group, and those are contact manifolds. There's a, uh, right, there's a, a, a theorem that says that every contact manifold is locally a Heisenberg group, and then so you can imagine modifying this uh, construction for the group to work for any contact manifold. So this can be done. It's a little bit of, uh, a little bit of slightly delicate, but let me just tell you the result. So, we have a smooth manifold with a one form. A non zero, nowhere vanishing, so. Uh, the kernel of this one form will be, of course, a co dimension one sub bundle of the tangent, sp tangent bundle. And in fact, the context structure is usually identified with this vector bundle, not with the specific one form. You can, of course, rescale the one form by a function, and you get the same uh, kernel. And the, the context structure is usually the kernel, this, this bundle H. Um, and then, so for this to be a context form, you want the d theta restricted to H uh, is actually symplectic. Right, so it's, it's like an odd dimensional cousin of a symplectic manifold. <coughs> okay, then, uh, then there's a theorem. So this is a, just a geometric theorem, the boost theorem. It says that locally, every contact manifold is isomorphic to the Heisenberg group. And uh, of course, I need to tell you how the Heisenberg group is a contact manifold. There's a standard contact form on it. For example, you could write it like this. They've taken the non-symmetric uh, version. So, OK. so. Uh, with a little bit of faith, and this is actually, uh, so this turns out to be correct. Um, we can modify, we can basically make a groupoid uh, modeled on this, uh, uh, on, this, on this example here for any, for any contact manifold. Uh, like I said, it's a little bit delicate uh, to get it to work exactly, but. Uh, so this one I'm going to call uh, T sub H of M, H being the contact structure. As usual, you get the pair groupoid at all non-zero t. And then there's a specific blow-up happening. And if you sort of study a little bit what happens here, uh, the blow-up will, of course, be related to these dilations that are of degree t squared in certain directions. And morally speaking, what you do is, if you understand the blow-up uh, construction for the usual tangent groupoid, you kind of blow up uh, h, the h directions by, by t inverse as you get closer to zero, and the transversal direction with t inverse squared. Now, that, like I said, this has to be interpreted in the correct way, otherwise, okay, uh, it, it, okay but, but it can be done. So, so the thing you get uh, at zero, though, uh, is like there. It's a family of groups, namely family of Heisenberg groups. So it's no longer uh, just a tangent space. It's no longer just an abelian uh, family of abelian groups. Uh, and I've adopted the notation uh, T sub HM. So here T sub HM is, uh, well, TM as a manifold. 
uh, more than a manifold, but, but as a manifold, let's keep it simple. So uh, uh, with the nilpotent group structure, with the non-abelian group structure, well, So there's a specific way, so if you want to know how, so this is identified with uh, HM cross R. Uh, this is done via theta. You have, a, you have a one form, so the normal bundle but can, can be identified with R. Uh, so every tangent fiber is H plus R. And then here we have D theta, which is symplectic. And as you know, if you have a, a symplectic vector space cross R, it's a Heisenberg group in a sort of canonical way. So this is a Heisenberg group. So uh, the groupoid here is like the tangent groupoid, but with a different way of blowing up M cross M using, you know, uh, a mixing of T and T squared. And at the origin, you do not get a family of abelian groups, but you get a family of Heisenberg groups. Thought of as basically the tangent, again, the tangent bundle, if you like, but uh, the different group structure. So the initial uh, sort of pursuit was to try to take what uh, Claire and George had done and maybe adapt it to this setting. Okay, and. Uh, in the back of my mind, there's, there's further uh, things I would like to do. For example, okay, I explained it for context structures because uh, I can explain it in this way. But uh, if I had more time, you can literally pick any, any sub-bundle H here. It doesn't even have to have co-dimension 1. It could be any sub-bundle. Uh, and you can define a groupoid using blow-ups in the same way. You blow up by a factor T inverse direction of h, t inverse squared in the transversal direction, this, you can make sense of this. And you get something at zero, which is a family of nilpotent groups. They're not all isomorphic. They, they can vary from point to point. Okay, but it's still a, a bundle, it's still a groupoid, a bundle of nilpotent groups here. And uh, you would like to know, is there some kind of calculus there? Or I would like to know. Not a lot of people would like to know, but I would like to know. And uh, then you look in the literature and there are various papers written over, mostly in the 90s, I, I think, uh, for special cases. So the Heisenberg calculus is specifically, initially is defined for contact manifolds. The reason uh, that's tractable is exactly because of Darboux's theorem. So a lot of the stuff you have to do in pseudo-differential calculus where, you know, everything has to be coordinate independent. Well, this makes life a lot easier. Uh, and then you search and there's no... Well, this Beals and Griner's book, which do it for general uh, co-dimension one bundles. And then, okay, I talked to Pierre Jules like last year, and he needed for a specific co-dimension three bundle. And being an honest man, he couldn't find any references where the Heisenberg calculus was developed for that case. Of course, you know, you can have faith, and surely it's going to work. But then you look at the various approaches, and they're all different. And it's not clear exactly... You know, I wouldn't want to have to repeat that, and it's not so clear if, I, if, you, know, if you can just do that. So, um, for various reasons, aesthetic reasons, and also somewhat practical reasons, uh, it would be nice to say, um, look, we figured out how to, okay, I haven't explained how, but there's a way to define a groupoid, which is obviously the correct groupoid for that given calculus. We don't know for sure that the calculus is really well defined or that it even exists exactly. We know more or less what it should be, but then you have to check so many things that it's, it's somewhat intractable. I would like to say, because the groupoid exists, the calculus exists. Okay? And, and, and this seems to somehow be a good step in that direction, but uh, reading through their paper, it became clear that what they prove is that that integral there gives a pseudo-differential operator, and then you know, they already, there already exists a pseudo-differential calculus, so they don't have to prove that there's a calculus. The calculus is already there, and then you prove that you get something in the calculus. What, I, what, what Bob and I were considering is something stronger. You would like to say, I don't know yet if there's a calculus, but I have, a, I have the groupoid, so therefore there is a well-defined calculus with all the relevant properties. We also have to figure out what the relevant properties are, of course. But, right, so it's just, you want something a little better, 
uh, than, than what, uh, what these guys did. Of course, this was also not particularly the goal of their paper. They had other fish to fry, but... Uh, okay, so this, this kind of led to, uh, to our discussions, and uh, as I said, we, we wandered off quite far from the original idea and came up with something uh, different. So, the idea from uh, the paper of the Boren Scandalese that we uh, elaborated on is the observation, which I'm not sure, I, I, it's pretty obvious, I just have never noticed. Uh, I'm not sure whose idea it is either, but uh, that these groupoids, both of them, so the tangent groupoid of, of Kahn and this new sort of tangent groupoid like thing for the Heisenberg calculus, that they have a, an action of R plus, of the positive reals, by automorphisms. Um, it's fairly staring in the face, more or less. Uh, for non-zero t, you can simply rescale the R parameter. Okay, that's obviously a, an automorphism. You just move one copy of m cross m to another copy of m cross m. And then you need to figure out what happens in the fibers here. And it turns out that by virtue of how the groupoid is constructed, you're just sort of blowing up the fibers by their, by their appropriate dilations, either rescaling of Rn or using these deltas uh, for this groupoid here. So let me write that down. There's an R plus action. by automorphisms of, of either of these groupoids. So let me write it down for this guy. Um, we call it beta. So beta lambda of x, y, t. So this is for t is not zero. This is just x, y, lambda t. Right, so... Uh, You just take something that sits here and move it over there. Just rescale the parameter. Uh, but of course, uh, that, uh, this, this fixes t equals zero. So um, beta lambda, okay, I'm going to write this. So let me call the base element x and then the, okay, the group element maybe g. Um, and I think maybe this is inverse, yeah. Uh, lambda, sorry. Okay, so this, this then is a smooth, um, it's a diffeomorphism of the groupoid, but it's also an automorphism of the groupoid. All right, so there's an action there. Um, okay, and then um, roughly the idea is that uh, somehow if you put the pseudo differential operator at uh, at the, at the, okay, so the current, a Schwartz kernel of a smooth, of a pseudo differential operator at positive t, and its symbol, or, okay, the convolution counterpart of the symbol, which is uh, whatever, the co symbol, some, Bob called it co symbol, I like that word. Where did you get that? Is that an established term, or did you make that up? Make it up? Okay, well, anyway, I call it co symbol now, so the, the current, the convolution kernels that are Fourier dual to the symbols, so they, they live here. Uh, this glues together some, in some appropriate sense. And uh, what you would like to say is that uh, the pseudo differential things are characterized by, the, by homogeneity for this action beta. And the more we talked about it, the more that seems to take care of pretty much everything. There's a slight uh, modification that seems to be necessary, but. Uh, it looks like that might be as simple as that. So let me try to explain this uh, more carefully. So you represent a pseudo differential operator by its Schwartz kernel. But um, I don't know why, but it's at some point dawned on me that it actually, so Schwartz kernel is. Um, there's a distribution on m cross m, but uh, those do not form an algebra, so this is, I'm going to propose a slightly different way of looking at it. So there, there, there are operators from C infinity m to C infinity m, continuous linear, 
Right, so the kernel should be somehow in, uh, in here. So there are families of compactly supported distributions, smooth families. So, so the way I'd like to think of the Schwartz kernel is as a family of distributions. each with complex supports, and uh, this should be a smooth family. In the appropriate sense, so let, let me not get, not get into that, so. All right, so um, this, oh, sorry about that, okay. Um, Well, okay. Um, uh, after some thought uh, uh, on this uh, this way of looking at Schwarz kernels, uh, I realized you can you can do the same thing on any Lie groupoid. So there, of course, the Lie groupoid is, uh, is M cross M. Uh, and uh, I explained this last week in uh, in gory detail. So let me. Just review, since a lot of people weren't there. So what we are going to look at here are distributions parameterized by, uh, by the base of the groupoid. Each distribution is compactly supported in the range fiber. And again, these are s supposed to be a smooth family. So smooth family means that uh, that really the, what you have here is a map from C infinity G to C infinity of the base. Continuous. Okay, so those are, uh, you could call them fiber distributions maybe on the, on the legal point and it's, it, the idea is to generalize this particular point of view on Schwarz kernels. And uh, so let's let's call this thing. Uh, okay. okay. So this is supposed to mean something like uh, they're compactly spared to distributions on the fiber of R on G. Okay, so suggestive notation. Uh, the point is that this is a convolution algebra in a completely natural way, without uh, need to pick Haar measure. Um, and the, the formula is as follows. If you have two such families, then the, OK, I need to define what uh, convolution product is. So I'm just going to use the formula I use for groups. Say we have a smooth function on the groupoid. OK, I need to map to the, to the base, to functions on the base. And this is. Uh, let me write the formula and then explain it. Uh, on a group, this is the definition of convolution of distribution. So notice that there's no Haar measure or anything. The measure is absorbed in the distribution. Uh, and the only thing you need to, I need to maybe comment it in order to make sense of this is that this is a function of gamma 1 to be taken as a function of gamma. Okay, so there's something to prove here, but um, this, this, this works. Okay. So f how does this relate it to the usual way of defining convolution, say for smooth functions? Uh, okay, if you're familiar with legal points, you know there's Haar systems. So if you pick a Haar system, say a smooth one, a family of densities on G and the range fibers of G, then every smooth function with compact supports Multiply it with the Haar system gives you one of these guys. It's just a function times the Haar measure on that fiber. Okay, and then this uh, this formula here uh, gives you exactly the convolution product of functions. Okay, so you can think of, uh, but of course here we don't. It's, so it's the same as on groups. You can 
you can pick a hard, hard measure and define convolution or you can convolve distributions. And this is a way to convolve distributions on a, on a group void. So the uh, weakness of this uh, point of view so far is that there's no, no well, haven't figured out a, a star yet. Uh, obviously, if you do the usual thing, uh, you get instead of families on the range fibers, you get families on the source fibers, and so it's not the appropriate object. So that, that's something I haven't figured out yet. But uh, at least we have an algebra. So right. So so trying to uh, generalize what what happens up there. Um, now, <clears throat> as we know, so. Uh, so any, any reasonable notion of pseudo-differential operator is of this type, but it's, it's much better than this. It has to be pseudo-local at the very minimum. So this is true for the Heisenberg calculus and the classical calculus, uh, which means uh, in this uh, setting on operators on M that the singular support of K is on the diagonal. In other words, uh, the singular support of K sub X is at X, at the unit of the, of the groupoid. Okay, so uh, we can define a subalgebra of this guy. Let me call it uh, regular ones. These are families in the big algebra, such that uh, the singular support of u sub x is just x. So that gives you what you want. So now it's, this is sort of uh, some sort of pseudo locality. Okay, so now we have a smaller algebra. Okay, and then here's the, the main idea or proposal. Um, there's something, let's call it fat psi. M, these are elements in this uh, regular convolution algebra. Well, it's called groupoid. So you can put either of the two groupoids that I've explained there. Uh, and U is beta homogeneous. And then, okay, so I have to. Confess, I got confused this last night. I believe it's negative n minus m, but I'm, now when I checked it, I wasn't 100% sure, but I believe that that's the correct one. Um, so this is supposed to be operators of degree m, expressed as operator kernels. Um, notice that this is a family of things on the well, it's not exactly correct. I'm going to modify this in a second. There's a slight modification necessary, but let's stick with this idea first. Um, what you have at t equals zero are simply homogeneous kernels. So this would be the leading order part of the, of the symbol or the, of, or the kernel expansion, if you like, of the pseudo-differential operator. Um, but away from t equals zero, you do not just have a highest order part. You have lower order parts. Uh, and they by virtue of the, re the way the rescaling happens, it just vanishes as t goes to zero. Um, away from t equals zero, so for positive t or negative t, the homogeneity just says that you basically repeat the same operator for every t up to a appropriate rescaling. So uh, the thing that happens is as you approach zero is that you blow up the diagonal, you appropriately rescale the distribution so that they somehow have a limit and the limit will just be the leading term in the expansion. That's, that's intuitively the idea. Um, now, so what this this one. No. Oh, sorry. So the the point is that the delta function, which is uh, say multiplication, what is, what is M. M. This one. It's a smooth manifold. So let's say compact to not get. Oh, so, 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 okay, sorry. There's other examples, but I just give you two. 
So any sort of reasonable groupoid that, that has a deformation uh, from operators to symbols. Sorry? Yes, so for that's so just uh, Okay, now if you know uh, the kernel picture of pseudo differential operators, uh, you know, well, another way to notice is if you're familiar with the Wojcicki residue. If you reach uh, degree negative n operators, uh, the kernel expansion starts to. Uh, uh, get log terms in them, okay, so, uh, and log terms are not homogeneous, but they're almost homogeneous, so log of Cx is log x plus a constant, log C, so, so they're sort of homogeneous modulo something, so uh, what, uh, one motivation for to, to, therefore to modify this thing is to take account of these log terms and, uh, how do you wipe? Germany is hard to, has a hard wiping culture. I can not figure it out. There's something on the right hand side there. There's a sponge. Okay. A sponge, okay, good. Um, let me get rid of this here. Okay. So, um, so, what do I mean by homogeneous modulo C infinity? I mean that if you rescale it, it's. Uh, you know, t to the negative n minus m, or lambda to the negative n minus m, times the original. And if you take the difference, it, it's allowed to be smooth. So in this sense, if you think of r, okay, you have log x, or log absolute value of x, it's actually homogeneous of degree zero, modulo smooth functions. Because if you rescale it, you pick up a c, which is a smooth function, and it's constant. So, right, so you, this gives a looser notion of homogeneity that is exactly what you need to get these kernels to work and it's very natural because uh, these are actually just the smoothing operators uh, as you know very well like the whole definition of pseudo differential calculus everything's up to smoothing operators the symbol is up to smoothing operators you, you always disregard smoothing operators so in some sense this is a very natural thing to throw in for, for that reason um, and the other reason it's convenient is that uh, uh, for the Heisenberg calculus, okay, if you go to t equals zero, so at t equals zero, as I said, you get the, you get, instead of a symbol, you get a kernel, or a convolution with a distribution, but it's, if it's homogeneous, it's not compactly supported, and you cannot a priori convolve to distributions that do not have compact supports. Now, this can be fixed, but it's like incredibly annoying, and you know, it's just, you have to uh, actually work quite hard to, to, to make all that precise, and so, this too allows us to not worry about that at all. You just uh, take the hom some homogeneous kernel. Let me, here's my picture. I don't know if hopefully this makes sense. Here's a homogeneous kernel, some singularity at the origin. And you just chop it. You just sort of give it compact support. You ignore what happens outside some compact thing. You smooth it out. Okay, that's no longer homogeneous, but it's homogeneous modulo CC infinity functions, and that's good enough. And those things can be convolved on the nodes without further technicality. So it, it's also. Uh, makes the uh, definition of the symbol a lot less technical. So that has se several advantages to throw this in. Okay, so. And, uh, okay, now you can worry about all sorts of things, and we did. So and in a month, we sort of came to some confidence that this works. That this, like, the confidence is not a proof, but uh, let me try to share the confidence. One thing that uh, you should worry about maybe is that the leading part at t equals zero, which is the homogeneous part of the leading part of the, of the uh, kernel expansion, interpreted as a symbol, well, it's only the leading part. And this is typically one of the things that I've always sort of struggled with in, in understanding the tangent groupoid relation to the pseudo differential calculus. Like, it seems to only understand the principal symbol and not this, this, this expansion. But what seems to happen in this case is since this is smooth, on the entire groupoid. It's also smooth in T. And if you write um, uh, a Taylor expansion in T, the homogeneity, so there's actually in T you're going to rescale. Uh, that's going to force an asymptotic expansion on the, on the kernel away from T. 
Okay, even though at t equals zero, there are no, there's no, no hint of the lower order uh, terms in the expansion. They, they're sort of forced on you simply by, well, as I said, we haven't really proven this, but it seems to be forced on you by, by simply by uh, Taylor expansion in T of such things. So it's, it looks as if, at least so, like I said, it's a proposal or an idea, and um, we've checked, uh, you know, we looked down all the avenues, and it seems to have at least ideas of proving the various things that need to be proven without actually having done it. Uh, so I have to be honest. Uh, this may not work out, but it, I, I'm, I'm, I'm confident enough to, to, to be embarrassed uh, a year from now that, this, that it didn't work. I think there's a very good chance to work on maybe with, with some modifications here and there. So, um, all right, so what uh, we would like to prove then, let me, where's the time? Yeah, in closing, so, I have to erase now, right? So, I learned this from Masood last week. He did have this very great uh, opening of windows. There's a lot of space left, so I can... Um, so, okay, I would like to say, so I'm not going to prove that this is the classical calculus, because it's exactly what I don't want to do. I want to prove that there is a, but then what do you mean by a calculus? What do you need from a calculus? What, you know, so uh, there are a list of things, and uh, of course the purpose here is to do something useful for index theory. Right, that's the motivation here, so I'm not, I don't know why, what all the things analysts need of a, of a calculus I uh, can't claim to completely understand, but I do think there's, you can sort of understand what we need, and it's a little bit more than you might think, so uh, there's a number of things you want to prove. And I think if you prove all those things, you can legitimately claim that you have a pseudo-differential calculus that does everything you need. Um, first is, um, okay, if the principal symbol is invertible, well, okay, so co-symbol, but that's analogous, right? So the, 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 the t equals zero part in this algebra, then the whole thing is invertible. Of course, here also mod. Okay, so this is, of course, the, one of the great features of a pseudo differential calculus. The invertibility of the leading symbol guarantees the invertibility of the full symbol. Right, so, in other words, you have a, you have a pair of metrics. Uh, so, that needs to be proven. That's maybe one of the most important things. Um, otherwise, you don't have a, a, a usable notion of ellipticity, a checkable notion. So, um, then you want, uh, okay, the, of course you want it to be a filtered algebra. Um, ah, this doesn't go down any further. Okay. Uh, what else? Um, let me see, I made a list. Okay, important thing is, here's my criterion. I want to be able to form a k-homology class out of an elliptic thing. So the typical way to do that is to make it bounded. And the way you make things bounded is, if you have an operator p, you take p times 1 plus p star p to the negative a half. That's the sort of standard thing. You're supposed to get something bounded. So what you need for that is that 1 plus p star p inverse uh, is of order negative 2. <coughs> M, I guess, if M is the order of P. So, but that's more or less taken care of by, by this here. Uh, the invertibility of the operator should, this, if you prove this the correct way, then the parametrics will have the negative order of the operator. Um, but there's a star thing in there that, uh, no, that worries me a little bit. So, okay. so we may have to confront the star at some point. Um, so. um, and, uh, yeah, but still, then you need to, uh, okay, so then you get an operator of order m times an operator of order negative m. It's, we have, if you prove it's a filtered algebra, you get something of order zero, but now you need that to be bounded. So 
you will have to prove that order zero operators are bounded. And uh, also that uh, negative one order operators are compact, but that's fairly simple because uh, the degree of homogeneity of the kernel forces it to be L1, and then it's, it's basically automatically compact. So. Uh, if, if you, yeah, if you're going, but that's also, it's, it's going to be L1 on the group point, so it's going to be in the C scale, yeah. So if, uh, if in the, okay, sorry for all this uh, back up and down. For the dot, dot, dots, if you start putting foliations here and stuff like that, you will have to, I mean, I'm, right now I'm just trying, since we're just looking at technical details, I want the examples to be as simple as possible. Just, just to do it for the classical calculus would be the first goal, and hopefully, the modifications won't be too severe for the, for the other uh, examples. Um, so, yeah, so I mean exactly what you said. Um, so that one, and then, um, well, I think that's it, actually. So I think that's sufficient. So then I think, okay, so, so what you get then is a theorem that says that uh, in, by, by just doing everything the usual way that and there's a calculus. If the principal symbol is a vertible, which is, which is a checkable condition, you have a, a Fredholm operator with a, with a parametrics. It defines a cohomology class. And moreover, from the groupoid, you get right, the usual analytic index map from the k-theory of the symbol algebra to, to z or the k-theory of the groupoid in, in the more general settings. And, uh, and this, too, will prove that that map is the analytic index for this class of operators. So this is, I think, basically what you need to do index theory. And so maybe, you know, maybe an analyst says, well, you need a lot more than this. Where's the solvable theory and such, such, and such. But I think for index theory, these are the things that suffice. And so we haven't done them yet, so it's a wish list. But uh, okay, so I thought it would be interesting to also, maybe somebody has ideas that would be useful. So anyway, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stop early. I don't think anybody minds. Thank you. Nigel, that's mean. <laughs> you had time to prepare. Would you like a question to ask me? Yes, no. It's a popular term, which is an averaging of the multiplicity, but it seems to produce something which is exactly what you would say, not approximately. Can you comment on the prospects of existence between that theory and the Yeah, because of course they do the same thing with the symbol, right? So yeah, yeah. Um, no, that I cannot. That's a good question. Yeah. Should be. Uh, is there, a, is there a precise idea, a notion of enveloping algebra for those things? Yeah. Okay, then you'll have to explain it to me. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'll look at that. <laughs>